Praise God. We've been talking the, the last couple of times on putting go in the gospel. And um, we're, uh, this is actually kind of a, um, a, a, not a supplement, but an extension of the second aspect of putting go in the gospel. The first week we talked about putting go in the gospel uh, will, would give us the ability to see like God sees. You know, if we don't have a mind, a, a heart, and a desire to follow the uh, Great Commission, go into all the world from, from Mark 16, 15, preach the gospel to every creature. If we don't have a desire to be a part of that commission, uh, if, we, if, we, if we're just not obeying that, then we're not going to see these aspects in our life. You may find little bits of them here and there. You may find uh, 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 rays of some understanding of that, but, but all revelation is based upon obedience, and, and you're just not going to need it if uh, uh, revelation, if you're not going to be obedient. Paul was talking to the, uh, uh, giving an, uh, an account to uh, King Agrippa uh, and when he was kind of on trial before a, a governor and that king. And he said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Paul was given a mandate and he followed it all his life. He was entrusted with the gospel. He didn't look at it as just a, something that was forced on him to do, but it was something he did willingly because he, he relied upon the word of God to bring the power of God into his life to do what the gospel told him to do. Go and preach. Go and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and be given an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith. He said, Paul did that. He did that. because He obeyed that. And he relied upon the power of his spirit, the, the Lord's spirit to do it. And he relied upon the the uh, the the incorruptibility of that message, the incorruptible seed. Matt and I were just talking about a, a, a an incorruptible seed that uh, the living, abiding uh, word of God. There's no other answers for life's tough questions. There's no other solutions to life's tough problems. It's all found in the word of God. The entrance of thy word gives light and understanding and revelation and understanding to the simple. And so tonight, we've talked uh, the first week on this go in the gospel, seeing like God sees. The second we talked about uh, seeing God's mindset, where he is at, uh, when he talks about going to the lost, how far does he go? Well, it says in, in Luke 15, we read, uh, the shepherd goes out into the wilderness, leaving the 99 that are all safe and secure and goes after the one that is lost. And he goes and, and searches until he finds it. Or to the woman that loses one coin out of her uh, 10 coin stash. She, uh, she, she lights a candle, sweeps the house. She turns everything over and everything, trying to find the coin that's lost. And she sweeps and diligently searches it until she finds it. We, we were reminded from um, uh, Luke 14 how a great supper was made and friends were invited and, and everybody was coming to this uh, to this gathering, but that some of the people had invitations begin to turn their nose up of it. It wasn't important to them. The feast wasn't as good, and the the king lost uh, uh, lost a little bit of uh, uh, favor with those people. They uh, they said, I, "I I bought a yoke of oxen. I can't come. Uh, I just got married. I can't come. I went and bought a piece of ground. I can't go right now." And, and everybody had an excuse. And so he told his servants, you go out to the streets and the lanes of the city, go to the maimed, uh, the people that are hurting, and uh, invite them to come in. The servants came back and said, Lord, uh, we've done as you commanded, and still there's room. Then he said, go out a little further to the highways, the byways and the hedges, and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. God is always about the mindset of getting everybody in. He is, he's giving you a message to get everybody in. 
He's giving you the message to get the word to everybody that you can. And you know what? If you do that, not just in your ability, but in cooperation with the Holy Spirit, in partnership with a loving God, you're going to find out that your world is a whole lot bigger and your message is going to impact a whole lot more than you ever dreamed possible. I want to tell you that I can tell you, I can tell you that, that 47 years of speaking the word of God, the, the still the most enduring time to me is, is knowing that I'm reaching that person one-to-one. I was even out one time with my uncle deer hunting down in the in the streets or in the in the wilderness down in West Virginia near Elkins West Virginia down in the mountains it had snowed 12 inches that night i was out on one one place following some tracks and my uncle had gotten a deer earlier that morning and he really uh, since he shot his deer, he wasn't allowed to carry his gun anymore in the woods because there was only a one deer limit. And so uh, he was just out there walking around, and the Lord spoke to him. And he said, uh, go over to this tree and sit down. It's a snow-covered morning. There's 12 inches of snow that night on the ground. The sun was up. It looked like diamonds sparkling over. It was beautiful. He sat down under that tree, and in a little bit, An older man came up. He was out of breath and had been weary. He had been hunting all morning in the snow and the depth of it was getting to him. He came over and he said, do you mind if I sat down by this tree? My uncle said, sure. Within the next 20 minutes, he led that man to Christ. You see, God will always put you in a position. If you're saying, God, give me someone to talk to, he'll bring the person to you because he's cooperating with you and he knows who needs to get to you to get to heaven. I'm telling you, he is a good God. And tonight, we're going to talk a little bit more about the mindset of God and the limitlessness of his salvation. From Psalm uh, 71, we we spoke this the last time. Uh, It says in verse 14, But I will hope continually. I will praise you yet more and more. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and your salvation all the day, for I do not know their limits. See, there's no limit to the salvation of God. It's it's the answer for everything. And it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's the answer to the deepest parts of, of a hurting heart. It's the... It's the the straightener for the the crookedest life that's ever been lived. It's the 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 plane that smooths out all the rough places, and it's the it's the thing that can knock down every thing that stands as an obstruction uh, to your your health and well being. He's that kind of God, and uh, and and so it says right there. I'll go. In the strength of the Lord God, verse 16, and I will make mention of your righteousness, your goodness, your rightness of yours only. You know, the Bible says in Romans, it says the goodness of God leads us to repentance. I want to tell you something. Uh, uh, I'm a person that preaches hell. I'm a person that will preach that there's a wrong side to the other side of time. I have told countless people more than I could ever recount in my life. I've been able to speak to people in business on construction sites. We've owned gyms. I've owned concealed carry classes. I've been on the range. I've talked to people who were a, 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 a veteran contract soldiers, um, operatives, uh, Green Berets, Rangers, all of those in military. I've talked to some world-class power lifters. Uh, I've talked to people on the streets living under a bridge and people that have been in the boardrooms. God has given me a great opportunity overseas uh, in a lot of different places here in the States. And I'll tell you, the answer is always the same. Jesus is the lowest common denominator. You want to get, want to find the solution to every problem, you find the lowest common denominator and you start working the equation from there and Jesus is always the one that you can resort to first. He's the one that everybody needs. And the good thing about it is the road around Calvary where his cross was, where he hung on it to die for our sins and then rose again that third day. The road around Calvary is level. You can't get there any 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 closer to him than I can. 
and, and I can't get there any closer than you can. It's all level. We all come to that foot. We all come the same way. And he's a good God. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name of, uh, given uh, to men uh, under heaven among men uh, whereby we must be saved. It's Jesus is the answer, and he is the answer. But I want to tell you something. There are sometimes... We find ourselves with um, stressing things that make us not want to go as hard to some folks. Uh, they uh, maybe it's because of, of injuries in our life, or per, maybe the person that that we have had uh, uh, ought against people who have damaged us or have treated us unfairly. Maybe they're not first on the list to come to Christ. Or maybe we would sell them something off the cuff, uh, the cuff in judgment that really wasn't spoken out of a spirit of love and mercy. And uh, and there's things like this in the Word of God that we can talk to that will get us beyond uh, those things that sometimes block us from seeing a limitless God. And uh, and, and most of the time it's because we're setting the limits. And Jesus addressed that. And in the... Um, uh, Matthew 5 through 7, there's a there's the famous uh, section of scripture. It was called the Sermon on the Mount. And um, and it was a, a, a an incredible thing. A lot of people were listening to it. Uh, some people and Bible scholars have said that more than likely the Sermon on the Mount was quoted and spoken maybe a hundred times. Uh, you know, the disciples heard it. That's why uh, uh, three of the... Uh, uh, disciples could could reference some portion of the Sermon on the Mount uh, in different um, in different vernacular uh, according to their own way that they heard, but they still uh, had an agreement. And uh, and it started out with the Beatitudes and and uh, the blessed are you happily uh, spiritually prosperous are you to be envied. Everybody's listening to those things; they could get it. Um, Jesus had something to say in the Sermon on the Mount that dealt with in our everyday lives and how the presence of God can change things. And he set new commandments and he set new explanation and revelation to some of the old things from the older, the old covenant. And he talked about reconciliation with people. He talked about um, uh, the exercise of religious sacrifice. He also talked about uh, dealing with sexual temptation. And what about divorce? Um, words that ought to be backed by honesty. That's your yay be yay and your nay be nay. Uh, forgiveness over revenge. Possessing your possessions. All of those things are life things that the Sermon on the Mount uh, uh, teaches. And it would be do really well for us to uh, spend some time. Because character development uh, and, and purity on the inside can only work and coincide with power that we're, it, we want to emanate from our life to being people to Christ. Sometimes we're just con concerned with knowing how to get the miracles and obtain the faith and do the works. But I want to tell you something. Character development speaks a lot because it, it's married to the ministry of, of uh, works and miracles in Jesus' life. And if we go in Jesus' name, we're signing up not only on his purpose, but his character. And, and we need to develop the character of Jesus. And one of those things has to deal with an attitude. And uh, knowing the limit, limitlessness of salvation means that sometimes we have to confront things in our life that uh, keep us keep us down under, keep our lives from being set free and, and mobile to preach and to speak. And the one verse we're going to talk to uh, uh, to you about today is found in Matthew 5, 41. Just one little verse. A lot of other explanations took a lot more verses for the topics that he covered. But this is one that really hit home. And it was found in verse 41. It says, whoever compels you to go a mile, go with him too. I bet you that that stuck in those people that heard that like a spear in their back. Now the word compel means to force someone to do something. 
means to drive or to urge forcefully, to cause to do or occur by an overwhelming pressure. It, the word compel also has, is synonymous with the words like coerce, force, to muscle, to press or pressure. Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God and exerting authority and the rule of heaven over the lives and the things that we experience. And these people they were talking to knew very well what he was talking to about going a mile and how that pertained to our everyday existence. Let's give a little background. Judah and Israel was under the authority of Roman rule. They had a governor placed over them in that region, and um, they the governors reported to the emperor in Rome. The Roman law ruled Jerusalem at that time. They The Roman governors tolerated the Jewish law and the religion, but finally, the, and in all finality, Roman law uh, ruled. It could force under Roman law any person under Roman rule to carry a Roman soldier's backpack at least one mile. Now these packs were 70 to 100 pounds. Uh, a Jewish person could be going along in his day Let's just picture it, Conduct, conducting the business of his life. Maybe it's in early August, hot and humid. He's got an armload of groceries he's carrying home. He's been to the market. Maybe he's going in one direction because it's his wedding day, and he's all dressed up with his wedding garment on and ready to meet his new bride. Maybe he's going to a graduation party in another part of town, but he happens to go by a contingent or an attachment of Roman soldiers walking along the road, and somebody just picks him out and says, hey, you, carry my pack. Now, these Roman soldiers were not, they were not the smaller stature type people. These people were warriors. These people that were soldiers in Rome meant that they walked probably from Rome into Palestine. These people were tough. They could carry that pack, and they were big. They knew how to use their weapons. They were proficient. They were very, very adept to keeping law and order and everything at the, at the threat of losing their life for the disobedience to the commands of superiors. And they knew the law that says, you've got to carry my pack. It didn't matter where you were going. You were, might, might have all already been to your wedding, but now you're going in the opposite direction, a mile in the hot sun, carrying a pack, and now your wedding garment is not going to look good. Believe me, these kind of things were happening. And these Roman soldiers, they knew that it was like a goad to these, uh, to these people. They knew that it bothered them, that it was, uh, it was a, they got a kick out of it, but the Jews hated it. But they had to carry the pack. And Jesus is saying, you've got, a, you've got a, a person want you to carry that pack? A mile, you're obligated to that? I want you to go to another mile. No one likes pressure or force. Something to do something that you didn't expect. The demands you think are unfair. Are you like that in your life? Have you had that in your life? The enemy can use those occasions to cultivate a bad attitude. It can cultivate resentment, unforgiveness, and hatred. I can't tell you of the number of the men and some women that I have been able to reach uh, uh, over the years as I've been invited into prisons, some, some maximum security prisons, uh, some prisoners that are coming into chapel service with chains on their hands and their feet because they're dangerous even to other prisoners. We're not to shake hands with them or hug them or greet them with a hug of Christian love. You can't because there are barriers there. And there are people that are asking you from the outside, why do you go and talk to these people? Because these people are the 
the people who have raped somebody's wife or they murdered somebody's family. They're in there for all of the right reasons and they don't deserve anything else. There's resentment there. There's hatred there. And the forgiveness and the love of God into some people only go so far. I want you to know something. God has got a better plan and he deals with that. A kingdom dynamic is any truth that is applied. Uh, any commandment that God gives implies within that commandment the power and the energy contained within the commandment to fulfill and complete it. If God tells you to do something, he gives you the power within the, the command to do it, the power to accomplish it. Every word from God is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. The Bible says in Luke, the first chapter in the 37th verse, with God, nothing is impossible. In the Amplified Version, it says, No word from God is void of power, nor impossible of fulfillment. Isn't that incredible? The Second Peter 1 in verse 3 says, According as, as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain to life, the God kind of life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us unto glory and virtue. You see, God has called you to virtue. He has called us, virtue is the development of the character of God, is the development of the character of what is right. Virtuous means that you're, sta you're, you're living in a conduct that is a right conduct, that is a, a life-building conduct. It's something that doesn't tear down, but always promotes. It always lifts up. It always causes a shining and a, and, a, and a radiance out of your life. Virtue is an incredible thing, and we're called to glory. That is the manifestation of God's presence. We're called to glory and to virtue. We're to imitate him in all aspects of life. Apply that to being asked to carry that pack one mile. See how far it might get you. In 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, but as, as we have been given exceeding great and precious promises, that by these we'll be made partakers, partners of a divine nature. Partakers mean that I get what the promise says I can have. I link with that, and then divine life from that promise comes into my life. Oh, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Is it a mile out of your way? Jesus said, go two miles. Uh, don't only go the distance, but double the distance. What's, what's he telling that person that's shouldering that pack? He says, I want more for you than you want for me. I'm not going to carry it one mile it's hot, I know. You've been on the road a while. But I'm going to make it two miles because I want you to rest a little longer than what even I'm compelled to do. Well, that's really hitting at the heart of what an attitude is. Somebody says once this attitude determines your altitude. Am I just doing what's expected of me? Or can I release that doing into the mercy and the grace and the power of God? Living beyond the expectations lets me have the success of a second mile. Some live the whole life just doing what's expected. You're going to find that a lot of those people are living in a rut. When people come to me and they say, it just seems like my life is so boring. I, uh, you know, that I, you know, it's the same thing over and over. Uh, one person told me once that a rut is just a grave with both ends knocked out. You're just seeing nothing but just uh, uh, dirt on both sides. There's a pit. There's a there's there's a, 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 a line down the road, but you just see dirt. There's what's behind you. It's still dirt. It's just a rut. And and the reason being, and I tell people if you're bored. The percentage of your life that you were bored is the percentage of your life that you have not given to the Lordship of Jesus Christ because Jesus is not boring. He is always up to date. 
He is always doing something. The Bible says that the world could not contain the works and the things that Jesus did, if you could write them all down. That meant that all during the presence of his disciples, there was a continuing ongoing of the surge of the Spirit of God coming through that life enacted word made flesh as he continued to go another mile for people. Oh, he never just did what was expected of him. Let's look at a couple of, uh, of, of, of verses here uh, that, uh, that will c- pertain to that. But this is what I want you to say. I want you to see this, is that to be a successful second miler, that you're going beyond means that that second mile that you start is the one that God's going to give you incredible strength and power to walk with him. You see, it's saying, I'm not going to let the world set my limits. I'm going to let God set my limits. Stephen had given an account of the plan of God from Abraham through Moses and all the way up to the moment that they crucified Jesus. In Acts 7, it said that these these people in the Sanhedrin had looked upon him and they saw his face like an angel. He was a man full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. I'm sure that the morning that he woke up and that, uh, that he started his day, he did not realize that just in a few hours he would be standing right in the presence of God, already his life over. But he gave an account of the plan of God and these people that they were listening to were cut to the heart. It said that they began to gnash on him with their teeth. They brought him out to the edge of the city. They took up the rocks. There was a young man who was part of the Sanhedrin giving his consent to their to his stoning that they threw their clothes at his feet and uh, they began to pelt Stephen with stones, and before the last stone was thrown, he said, I see the heavens open, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And they ran toward him as the rocks begin to, 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 come, to come faster, more accelerated. He says that, he said, Lord, don't lay this sin to their charge. Boy, is there a second mile there? There have been plenty of moments for G, for Stephen to have said, Lord, you got to get them back. I'm one of yours. But he said, beyond that, don't lay it to them. Like Jesus did at the cross, Father, forgive them. That's a second mile, that's a second mile word, for they know not what they do. The young man who set that uh, set the, the close before him that consented to his death was Saul of Tarsus. No one had an idea what kind of a world changer he was going to be. But he caught the glimpse of the power of the love of God. That moment in that man's life, just one stone's throw away from meeting Jesus face to face. And he said, don't let this sin be be accounted to him. It had to stick in Paul's life. In the, in the, the uh, a chapter later, he's on his way to uh, Damascus to, to bring uh, the believers in, in Jesus back to Jerusalem. He had taken the properties of people. He had gotten people killed. He had thrown them in prison. And Jesus met him on the road. Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you? I'm Jesus. Well, he had never persecuted Jesus, but he was persecuting his body. When you persecute the body of Christ, you persecute Jesus Christ. And you know what? He said, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. You see, those words like Stephen said, those are sticking in Paul. Those are sticking. That's the second miler that, that went the ultimate second mile that only God could give him uh, the grace for. I'm thinking in Acts 16, Paul and Silas had gone to preach in the prisons in, in, or preach actually in the streets in Philippi. And uh, there were some occurrences there. And uh, they were falsely accused. They were thrown into jail, their feet fast in stocks at midnight. uh, uh, They were uh, singing and praising God. It said that all of the prisoners in Acts 16, all the prisoners in the prisons heard it. They were giving thanks to God and suddenly there was an earthquake. All the chains fell off of everybody's feet. The prisoners began to look around. 
The doors were opened. The, the, the chains were, the, the stocks were undone on their feet. Paul had been beaten and Silas had been beaten with stripes. And the jailer that was in charge of all that, they saw the rumble. They saw the crumbling buildings and they saw that the prisoners were leaving. And, and he knew that there was a sentence of death on his life if any of them escaped. He was ready to kill himself. And Paul looked and said, do yourself no harm for we're all here. Second mile. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, he said in 1630, 32. And thy house. And immediately the jailer took him and into his house. He received Jesus. It said that his house believed and he washed false wounds of Paul and Silent. Second miler. Christianity, the part where the love of God takes over and pushes our faith further than we could ever dream possible. I'm looking into Acts 26 as Paul stands before King Agrippa and his, uh, and his wife and uh, the and Festus, the governor, and uh, he's, uh, he's giving an account of his... Uh, of his life and he's been charged with insurrection and he's appealed to Caesar and but there's no charges that they could send along with him from from where they were at on into Rome so so Festus brings Agrippa and and his wife down there because he's familiar with the customs of uh, the Jewish customs and familiar with this new way called Christianity Jesus being a savior and Paul is giving the account of how he was knocked down on a, on a Damascus road and he'd lived his life and he'd been persecuted and beaten and he is doing it all because of the resurrection of Jesus. And, 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 and the, the, the governor looked and said, Paul, much learning has made you mad. And he just ignored it. And he looked over to the King Agrippa and he said, he said, King Agrippa, I know that you are familiar with these customs and have concerned and, and, and knowledge about this way. Uh, uh, do you believe in the prophets? I know that you do. And King Agrippa said, he said, you almost uh, and, and almost together uh, today, I almost persuaded to be a Christian. And Paul looked and he said, I not only believe that you would be not almost, but altogether such as I am, except for these chains. You see, Paul wanted more for Agrippa and that governor and those Romans that stood around with all their pomp and their thrones and their, their piety and all of those other things. And here he is, a man bound to go to Rome in chains. And he said, I wish that you knew what I knew, except I wish that you wouldn't have these bonds on. You see, Paul was, was going the second mile. And that was the mile that took him over. And why was that? Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, in verse 14, the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that if one died, he died for all, then all were dead, but, but, and that he died for all. But we who live should no longer henceforth live unto ourselves, but unto him who died for us and rose again. Paul said, that love compels me. It constrains me. It pushes me out. It forces me. It makes me go further than the world would tell me that I had to go. My spirit would tell me, or my mind would tell me, or my feelings, or my resentment would tell me I'd have to go. The love of God, the love of God pushes me beyond those limits, and I can walk that second mile. 1 John 2 in verse 5 says that uh, if you abide in the word, his love will be perfected or made to run its full and complete course. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll have whatsoever you would ask, and it shall be done. Is there an end? Je the Peter asked Jesus, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive a man? Till seven times? And Jesus said, 
seven times 70 in a day if he comes back and asks. And why is that? Because there's no limit to the forgiveness of God. And understanding the mindset of God lets me know that sometimes it takes a second mile. Uh, several years ago, I was speaking in a uh, uh, Department of Youth Services in a place called Training Center for Youth. And uh, the, the place where I was speaking was actually the catch basin for every person that had been incarcerated as a youth into, into the youth system. This was the place that they wound up when nothing else could be done for them. They were, a lot of times, the habitual criminals, and most of the time, they were impulsively violent criminals. These were kids under the age of 17, and uh, they were tried as youths, but they have done hyenas, heinous crimes. And, uh, and uh, I, I spoke to those guys on a weekly basis. I provided them guitar lessons. You know, if God gave me an idea, you just don't go and have a Bible study, they won't listen. But if you do guitars, they'll all want to listen. So we'd have guitars, we'd share, we'd drink a little bit of coffee and share Jesus. We saw 600 of those kids come to Christ uh, during our time in ministry over there. The governor even gave us a, an award as, as a recognized ministry for a, as a viable deterrent to youth crime. But during that time, there was a young man over there. His name was Jeff. And um, Jeff was, um, was in for habitual rape, uh, violent rape. And um, sometimes on Sundays, we would go over to the chapel service. We were all young then. Our wives would come with us, and they were all young. And um, Jeff would always come to service. We'd have 200-plus two uh, young men in that service at one time. And uh, we would give altar calls, and there would be many that would come to Christ. Jeff never would. One time during the guitar sessions, he spoke to me, and he says, Was that your wife that was up there singing? on the platform uh, with you yesterday. And she, we were singing some gospel songs, leading praise and worship. And uh, I said, yes. He goes, well, she's very uh, uh, nice looking. As a matter of fact, I'd like to have your wife. Now, there is a part of me as a husband and as a man, there's, that's my, my, my mate, and that I felt like, to be honest, getting a little less Jesus in me to take him apart. You know, I mean, it's just the way it was. But um, I let that go. And the one thing about Jeff was is that always he would be coming to me week by week, never would listen to the gospel. But do you remember my name? He'd say, remember my name and everything. So uh, after he said that, I was kind of cool toward him for a little bit. And uh, I didn't see him for a few weeks. And then one day he was walking by as we were leaving the guitar lessons and he was out in the hall going in a line to someplace else. I looked over and I said, hi, Jeff, how are you doing? His head came from looking down to up and he acknowledged me. The next week we were over in the chapel service. He uh, responded to the altar call. He came and said, uh, and he asked Jesus into his heart, life changed. I don't think Jeff went into uh, on into youth uh, into the adult prisons. I think that things ended with him there. He became a model prisoner. I asked him though, sometime after that, what made you, after talking to you for two years, made you come, and and receive Jesus that day in that service? He said, "I'll tell you what." He said, "The other day when I was leaving, you spoke to me and you remembered my name. Nobody remembers my name." He said, the things that I spoke to you several weeks ago would have almost undoubtedly would have made you try to forget me, but you remembered my name. You know what? Going the second mile always works. It brings those things that will go beyond the barriers of my forgiveness or my tolerance or anything else and lets me see that if I would just take that next step, I'll do it with God. And if I can do that with God, then God has an entrance to come into that person's life and meet him say face to face. He is the God that loves us and cares. Let's, uh, let's pray uh, together tonight. There's a scripture that says in, in Galatians 5, for there is in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. So it's not about law keeping or this or that or anything that avails to anything, but faith 
that worketh by love. The word works there means it is working by, activated, energized, and working through love. Our faith could blow people off of the highway if it were faith by itself. Faith that works by love captures faith and brings that faith into a reality enveloped in mercy. And if we're allowing the love of God shed abroad in our hearts to propel us, our faith becomes real. Our faith becomes genuine. It becomes engaging to other people and that he'll have his way in a greater sphere of influence in your life. Father, I just ask you, Lord, that if we have any person out here that's been hindered because of resentment or unforgiveness, have uh, has really not uh, taken to heart those people who have injured them or hurt them in their life, that they need Jesus. And that perhaps if we would just say yes to forgiving them first, that we'll go that second mile. We'll take that step beyond fairness, beyond justice, beyond what all we think is due us, but, but we're just going to go that second mile and walk it out in mercy. Then you'll have control and you can see a completion, not only come into our life, but salvation, perhaps come into theirs. And we commit that to you. I ask you to bless our listeners as we go, go forth from here until next time. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a good evening.